you got your Bibles this morning, I pray that you do. If you'll turn with me to uh, Psalm 14. Today is going to be the last of the uh, summer psalms, I'm sure at some point. We'll come back to Psalms, maybe in between the series on other books, and, uh, and we'll pick it up on Psalm 15 then. Uh, but today we're at Psalm 14 and verse 1, if you could please turn there. If you could stand in honor of God's Word uh, as we stand, if you're able. Uh, we're just saying that God's Word has authority over my life, and, um, and I just want to receive that this morning. To the choir master of David, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand who seek after God. They have all turned aside. They have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteousness. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. Father, may your word be spoken boldly here today. And God, may you accompany this word with your signs and wonders. And Father, I pray that God, if there is a fool here, God, if there's a fool in this building, I pray by the end of this service that they become family and that they turn their lives and their hearts completely to Jesus Christ. And I pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Have y'all ever had moments in your life? No, all right. Nobody likes anybody calling you a fool, right? I mean, that's, that's just one of those things that my mom, but, you know, if I, if I would have used something like that when I was a kid, I better duck pretty quick because the hand was coming, you know. And, uh, but nobody, nobody likes to be called a fool. But I'm going to be honest with you. I've had a few instances in my life where I called myself one. You know, I, hey, I'm going to be very transparent. I had one of those instances this morning and uh, uh, fully intended uh, on teaching the membership class uh, today. Um, I set that class on the same day that um, um, I was uh, working what we call secondary and secondary is getting called into work um, to go sit with some kids this afternoon. And um, so, and I actually have known this for uh, a day or two, and um, I had, I had so graciously recruited uh, Miss uh, Jackie Saunders to do my dessert for me today, and I never told her that she didn't need to cook it, you know. And uh, I, I really felt foolish this morning, you know, and uh, and I didn't tell the families that were expecting the meal today. Hey, this is what's happening. Sometimes I. Sometimes you can get to juggling a lot of things, and I'll be honest with you, some weeks I juggle a lot of things, and, um, and I'm sorry about that. I told Miss Jackie, though, she still gets treasure in heaven for making that cake, all right? And uh, the Lord still, all right, because I'm sure she did it with all the right reasons. Um, probably one of the greatest experiences of feeling like a fool happened a couple of years ago when Sydney was still at home and she had a flat on her tire and so I decided that I would take um, her vehicle um, or at least the tire up to the co-op to get fixed I, I, I don't think I was in her vehicle and so I took her tire up to get fixed and, or maybe to exchange it out for another tire and uh, in my car at the time, this is when I had my Hyundai Sonata, 
but it had a tire repair kit in it. And, and I absolutely was, I had no idea what this thing was. Really didn't have instructions, but I get to the co-op. They said, hey, look, we are not going to be able to see you for at least uh, an hour. And so I said, that's okay. I'll be right out here, guys. And so I got back in my car. And, you know, when you've got a lot of free time and you're sitting around doing nothing, it, it can really get to be, well, it can be, get to be dangerous. And, and so I decided, I pulled that tire repair kit out, and I start, I plug it in. It's one, something that you plugged in to, I, I thought it was something like, like an air compressor or something like that. And I get to fooling with this thing, and I hit a button, and the next thing you know, and what came out of that was this sticky, latex, rubbery mixture all over my face, all over my shirt, all over the, the top of that car. Why are y'all laughing? It wasn't funny. And, and, and I'm like, that, that just happened. John Hush. <laughs> Guys, at that moment, I called myself a fool. And right after I called myself a fool, the, the guy from the co-op knocked on my window. <laughs> and I had to open the door, and, and he saw me just completely covered up with this late. Guys, it took me two days to get that off of me. Nobody had to call me one. I knew I was one. Well, that was foolish, but you know what? It really didn't make me a fool. I think there's a difference between doing foolish things and just, just outright being a, a fool. And in the scripture that God has given us today in Psalm 14, we have God's view of a fool. What God has to say. Now, I'm going to say some things that will first surprise you, but, you know, a, a fool is not defined as someone who does stupid things. That's not a fool, according to the Bible. A, a fool is not someone who, um, who espouses wrong political views, as you might be hearing right now. That, that doesn't necessarily that right there make them a fool. A fool is not defined as someone who squanders an opportunity or squanders money. That may be foolish, but it doesn't really make them a fool. A fool is not someone uh, who is full of himself, who is comfortable with injustice or someone who is disrespectful or unkind. That may be foolish, but it doesn't necessarily make them a fool. And you might be saying, well, Johnny, if these people are not fools, then who is? And you see, the problem with all of those definitions is they're more about what a fool does and, and not what makes them a fool in the first place. See, the thing that makes them a fool may cause some of those things. It may cause them to be unkind. It may cause them... Uh, to have some quacked, you know, political views. It, it, it may cause them, you know, to, to act um, in crazy ways at times. But, but the thing that causes a person to, boo, to be a fool or makes them a fool is what Psalm 14 says. Now, let me just go ahead and just hurt your feelings. Because when you line this up with the Word of God, you, you line it up with like Romans 3, the definition of a fool that's found in Psalm 14, and what Romans 3 says about all of us, that we all have sinned and we come short of the glory of God. I hate to tell you this, we are all have been fools in our life, all of us. 
Even Chuck Gates at times has been a fool in his life. Yeah, oh, thank you, brother, okay, because you sure amen me last week when I, anyway. Um, so what is the epicenter of foolishness? Well, according to this, it's a denial of the existence or the presence of God. You know, that you just the deny, that you just, and, and we're, it, we're, let's just dig into that. The very first thing that we see in the scripture is what we call the depravity of man. And verses 1 through 3 just really kind of lays it out because it says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and they do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. This sounds a lot like Romans 3 if you turn over there at some point. But the psalmist really begins at the root of it all. What's at the root of a fool? It is someone, according to him, who is in denial of God. Here, here is to describe. To describe a fool is someone who is living in utter godlessness. You see, a fool is not stupid. They're just stubborn. Hear me out. He, 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 he lacks not so much intellect as morality his is not a mental deficiency but a moral deficiency and it is not so much that God's existence is being denied they just think God's irrelevant that it doesn't really matter you know that that Psalm 14 1 it says the fool has said in his heart by the way the word there is right here, that's not in the Hebrew. It's implied. And so therefore the translators give it to kind of help make sense. But, but if you remove that out of there, the fool has said in his heart, what? No God. No God. No God for me. In other words, he lives as if God doesn't matter. He lives as if God doesn't count. He, he lives his life as if God is irrelevant. You know, from the very moment in Genesis 1-1 where it says, in the beginning God, from that moment on, that right there shows me that God is relevant. Amen. Okay, all right? I mean, it all begins with him. You know, I mean, if that is true, then that makes a big difference on whatever is said after the book of Genesis and, and over all the way into the book of Revelation. If you don't learn anything else, guys, God is very relevant. But very quickly, Adam and Eve, what did they do? They lived their lives as if God didn't count. They lived their lives as if God didn't matter. You see, they were these kind of, we like to throw around that word atheist. You know, people that doesn't believe. I remember the very first time somebody ever said that they were an atheist to me. I grew up in the backwoods of Mississippi. I mean, everybody, nobody dared say something like that where I grew up. But I went to boot camp out in uh, San Diego, California in the Navy. And, and, uh, and the very first time this guy stood up and he said, you know what? I am an atheist. It blew my mind. Absolutely blew my mind. But you know, according to this verse, you and I, all of us, at some time in our life, we have been practical atheists. We live our lives as if God doesn't matter. God is irrelevant. That there is no accountability. That, that, that God doesn't care. So I have to ask you the question this morning. Are you a fool? Are you living your life as a fool this morning? You know, believing that God is irrelevant. I can go out and live my life like I want, 
however I want, do what I please, whatever, whenever I please. What this word has to say is irrelevant. And, and, and you just, do you live your life as if God doesn't exist? Do you, do you live with this state of God amnesia? When it comes to parenting, when it comes to how you handle your money, because, you know, the Bible talks a lot about how we are to handle our money and our time and our talents. You know, when it comes to, you know, even your sexual life, and how you view sex, and how you view people of the other sex, and, and how you view this world. Guys, when it comes to all those things, do you live your life as if God doesn't exist? Now, David goes on and he describes them, doesn't he? You know, he said they are corrupt, they do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. He says, man, they are corrupt. They're sinners. They're sinful. That's what happens when you don't feel like God's irrelevant. When you feel like God's irrelevant, God doesn't matter. I do whatever I please. Hey, Sunday's my day. If I want to go, hey, do whatever I want to do. You know, hey, that, that's, that, that's, who, that's what I'm going to do. We, we, you don't feel like that there's any obligations of us in the Word of God. Listen, you just go out and you do your thing. You just want to be me. You know, I'm, yeah, I've heard my kids say this. It drives me crazy. I'm just doing me. <sighs> you know, guys, guys, it, listen, living as if God is irrelevant leads you down some terrible roads. Listen, we want to blame, you know what we want to do? We want to blame the environment. Well, I would do better in life, but you know, I grew up in public school, or I, I grew up in, around a family that, that you know, and, and we give all the reasons. We want to blame our environment. Well, listen to me. According to this scripture, Psalm 14, verse 1, the problem is not just around me. The biggest problem is in me. The fool has said in his heart, no, God. You know what this tells me? There's even times as a believer that I want to live as if there's no God. You know, I, I, I want to follow after pleasure. I, I, I want to follow after idols. I, 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 I want my life to be a certain way. And, 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 and I go chasing after these things. All of us, even as believers, there are times and moments in our weeks and days where we live as if there is no God. And, and so, uh, but listen, if you read this out, though, according to the Scripture, this is a universal problem. Listen, you know why sinners do sinful things? Because they're sinners. <laughs> you listen, God is not where he should be in their life. They're, they're not living their life for Jesus. And, and, and so not, not just this fool is a bad, bad person, but you know what? The Bible says that we have all sinned and we've all come short of the glory of God. We all at times have lived our life as if God was irrelevant at times we've all been very bad people some of us had some time for that sinfulness to live its way out and you found yourself doing some things that you never thought you ever would do in life and you found yourself chasing some things that you never thought that you would ever do in life and you find yourself in situations that you never thought. You know, I, and the problem is inside of you. You have said in your heart, no God. And so we see in the scripture that the corruption is universal in its scope. It's, it's comprehensive. We're all given to sin. We're all given to thinking, you know what? I know better with my life than God does. You know, we love evil more than we love him. We love evil more than we do good. And, and guys, this is the consistent teaching of the Bible that, guys, all of us, and we're born this way, 
we're all born totally depraved. That doesn't mean we're as bad as we could be, but listen, the potential is there. There is the potential of murderers in this room. There is the potential of adulterers, of, of family, you know, uh, just tearing families apart. Terrible things. It's in this room because we all have a bent towards sin and, and there's a sinfulness part of us. Even those who are redeemed, praise God, now in my life there's a battle that's going on. You know, and, 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 but once I was dead in my sins... And, and I was living my life as if there was no God. Dear believer, you need to be aware of your heart. Until we are glorified, until Jesus returns and takes us home, or you die and you go to be forever in heaven with your God, you are always going to struggle at times with sin in this world. You always are. And you need to be aware of that. You need to be aware that even if Christ is your Savior, that sometimes we're prone to wander. And if we accept the testimony of Psalm 14, well, how then should it affect us? Well, may we certainly pray, God, I need help. You know, Jesus himself, what did he teach us to pray? Lead us not into what? Temptation, but deliver us from what? evil you, you, you know and uh, one of my favorite little tools that I use in my prayer life and matter of fact I have a copy I, I got candy a copy and as well it's a book of of collection of Puritan prayers I tell you what those guys back then they knew how to talk to the Lord they really did and 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 I think it's because they didn't have a lot of distractions they just had the Bible and their family and the Lord and 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 so Arthur Bennett put some of those prayers together not things for us to repeat but I use these as guides in my own personal prayer life but but one particular of those prayers of Puritan prayers I think really hones in on a believer who understands I'm prone to wander this is what he said but in my Christian walk, I'm still in rags. My best prayers are stained with sin. My penitential tears are so much impurity. My confessions of wrong are so many aggravations of sin. Listen to what he said. I need to repent of my repentance. I need my tears to be washed. I never do anything else but depart from thee. And if I ever get to heaven, it will be because thou willest it. For no reason beside, I'm sinful even in my closet, closest walk with thee. It is of the mercy I died not long ago. My heart is an exhausted fountain of sin, a river of corruption since childhood days, flowing on in every pattern of behavior. Listen to me. That's a believer praying that, not some lost person. You know, but that's a person that gets, he's got a heart that is still sinful. Listen, we need to be weary. We need to be aware that that's our heart at times you know but after we see such corruption even among the religious by the way you know um, this was a psalm that was supposed to be sung in church to the Israelites to the religious to the, to the people coming to the temple and, 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 and so he, he's talking to them watch, watch your heart because it's the fool that says no God but, but it's, it's and, and, and then you read verses 1 through 3 in entirety, and you're like, man, everything is just so messed up. Is there any hope? And then you read verses 4 through 6. And what I call the delight of God, and, and have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord. There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is in his refuge. I mean, is there any hope in this world if we're all corrupt? 
Is there any hope in the world if we're all depraved? And, you know, as verses 1 through 3 says, I look around and everybody has got issues and problems with sin. How, how can there be a people then that he calls his people? That's what he does. Did you, did you see it? In the middle of verse 4 through 6, you know that in the midst of all this corruption, in the midst of all this sin, you know, he says, and God himself says, you know what? You know, they are messing with my people. How in the world, in, in the midst of all this generation of corruption, can there be a generation of righteousness? Or Paul was here. And he was expounding on this. I think he would say, how in the world can you have people who are dead in their trespasses and sins, who are by nature children of wrath, how in the world can those people be the children of God? And it's grace. It's grace. Saved by grace. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, he says, Paul writes, he says, and you, you, Chuck Gase, you back there, Johnny, Candy, you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. He says, you, you used to be like this. And the only way that you're not is that God has shown grace to you. God has saved you. God himself has redeemed you and changed your heart and your life. Or you, you would still be children of wrath. Our 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, or do you not know? That the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. He just said we're, we're all messed up. Do, do not be deceived, neither sexually, immoral. Man, so many are idolaters, so many of us are adulterers. And, and Hey, could be us, nor men who practice homosexuality. Is that an issue in our world? Absolutely. Nor thieves nor the greedy, oh my gosh, you're meddling now, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, all of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says, and such were what? Some of you. But you were what? Washed? You were sanctified? You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Man, isn't that a wonderful, wonderful thing that God would save you out of that? I am not an Alabama fan. I know some of you are, Jackie. I see you out there. But you know what? I'm not going to say, I'm not going to pick on you today, Jackie, because you've, you've been good to me today. So I'll pick on Robert. When I was growing up, I remember the days of Paul Bear Bryant. I mean, in the 1979 Sugar Bowl, the University of Alabama defeated Penn State 14 to 7. And on the night after um, the Sugar Bowl, some of the Alabama uh, worshipers, Emmy Loyalists, uh, 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 fans, they were having a party in the suite of the, the legendary Coach Bear Bryant in the Hyatt Hotel. And, and, and Coach Bryant had on a brand new t-shirt, but one of them noticed he had a hole in it. And so they, they pointed it out to him like, Coach, did you know that your t-shirt that looks new has a hole in it? And Paul Bear Bryant said this. He said, um, he said, actually, every new T-shirt I buy, I tear a little hole in it. 
because I never want to forget where I came from. And no matter what success and acclaim that he ever got as a coach, he always wanted to remember that he grew up in a rugged farm in Arkansas, a place that was not even on the state map at that time called Moro Bottom. Let me tell you something. Dear Christian, you need to never forget where you came from. Okay? And as Christians, we, we, hey, having no hope without God in this world, we were children of wrath. Such were some of you. And, and, and then it, it just, hey, it just goes on. He says, man, they have no knowledge. All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread. I mean, this is where this disobedience, they're eating up God's people and do not call upon the Lord. They are in great terror for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would, uh, you would shame the plans of the poor, but Lord is his refuge. And, and so though God's people, listen, though they may, they, God's saying here, look, my people may get eat up like bread. In other words, you know, you know, in other words, people are doing evil to God's people without even thinking about it. It's like eating a sandwich, you know, like eating bread. They're just going through God's people. And and but notice this. They he says they are talking about the wicked are in great terror. Why? Because this the Lord, the Lord is is with the generation of the righteous. Amen. Hear me out. These evil ones may shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. No, notice, it's like, the, the, it's like God is breaking in on the psalm. And like I, God through David is saying, you know what? I've got something to say. And these evil people may be doing some wrong. And they may be wiping out other, uh, my people, but they don't. It's almost like my mama, you can mess with anybody's kid, but don't you dare mess with hers. Same thing with Candy Beaver, you know. I mean, you mess, but man, you start messing with hers, mm, you know. Let, let me tell you something. She don't even take my side. On some things, on some things. Maybe, maybe, maybe or not, I was wrong. I don't know. You know, I, guys, why? Because don't mess with our kids. And it's almost like God comes in, doesn't it? In the scripture, and like, you know what? They're doing some things, but they better watch out because they're messing with my youngins, my people. They are mine. Don't you know who you're messing with? And, and then whatever you may do or try to do to God's people, the Lord is their refuge, that it's futile, you know, to think that you're going to get away with that. Why? Because listen to me, y'all need to hear this this morning. God intends to bless his people. God intends to bless you. God intends to protect you, to walk with you. Guys, that is His revealed. God is committed to His children. And if you're one of His kids today, and you've given your life to Jesus Christ, I just want to tell you today, God's committed to you. And you might be in a bad place right now. And you might be discouraged. And you might feel like, where in the world? Listen to me. Your faith needs to kick in, like we've been saying for weeks here, and, and proclaim my God loves me still, and he is for me because of Jesus. I'm in Christ Jesus, and he loves me very much. Now, let's, uh, does that mean we don't suffer? That's not what he says. Matter of fact, he says, they're, they're taking down my people like bread. They're mowing them down. But it's almost like in the case of Joseph, you know, Joseph could have, could have said many times, Lord, where are you? Why am I in this pit? Why am I in this jail? Lord, why am I in this, you know, position? And you know what? Eventually, you know what he told his brothers? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Listen, you've got to believe that right now in your life that you've got a God that is for you. You are part of the righteous because you're in Christ Jesus who 
who is righteous. And, and listen, your protection, your refuge is in God. Listen, you don't trust your bank account. It can disappear. Don't trust your spouse. They may die. They may go willy-nilly. I don't know. But guys, you put your trust in the Lord because you can take it to the bank God is for you. And if you ever feel like you're getting counted down in this depraved world that's filled with fools doing their own thing, who doesn't believe that God is relevant, I want you to know this. You are God's delight. Amen. You're his people. And he's committed to you. And he loves you. But listen, it gets even better in verse 7. It's the deliverance of the redeemed. Oh, the salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. You know, as you read this passage, there's no doubt God's people is going to suffer. Can I just say this? We don't suffer like other parts of the world suffer. But living for Jesus can be tough. Some of you students have gone back to school and, and, and your faith is going to be tested. Living for Jesus, not getting caught up in the drama of somebody else and the nonsense, all these people that want to live their life like there is no God. It's going to be hard for you to be light and salt and making high and making junior high wherever you go to school. It's going to be difficult. Sometimes you're going to feel like that they're eating you like they are eating a piece of bread. But you know there's parts of this world where people are giving their life because of their faith. You know, he said they swallow up my people like scarfing down their lunch. Unfortunately, Psalm 14 is very current. You know, I was reading in Christianity Today this week this article. It's entitled 50 Countries Where It's Hardest to Follow Jesus in 2024. Almost 5,000 Christians were killed for their faith. For their faith. Because they stood up and said, I am a believer in Jesus Christ. 5,000 last year. 4,000 others were abducted. Nearly 15,000 churches in our world were attacked or closed. More than 295,000 Christians were forcibly displaced from their homes because of their faith. You can't live here. You can't live in this nation. You can't live in this area. And they were literally forced out of their homes. Imagine that happening. Listen, that's one in seven Christians worldwide, including one in five believers in Africa, two in five in Asia, one in 16 in Latin America, you know, facing persecution. You want to know where it's hardest to follow Jesus? Hey, there's your countries right there. And I've been in a couple of those. I've been in one, all right, not a couple. Listen, Christians are getting mowed down. I want to show you a quick video. We're, we're almost done, and Garrett, you may have to help me because it wants to show a little commercial before the video, you know. And uh, if it does that, do me a favor and... Oh, there you go. What's happening now is just too important to miss. Watch this. Although fewer Christians died for their faith in Christ last year, Christian persecution is up, increasing to the highest level ever reported. According to Open Doors, a ministry to the persecuted church, one in seven Christians worldwide now experience high levels of persecution or discrimination. Part of the reason that it's getting worse is because it is getting worse in more places. So particularly this year, we see the spread of violence against Christians in sub-Saharan Africa. In the 10 countries where Christians experience the most persecution, seven of them are in countries like Somalia, Sudan, and Eritrea.
But this year, North Korea earned the top spot as the worst country offender. In 2020, the communist regime passed a new thought law, increasing punishments for consuming Western radio and TV broadcasts, as well as Christian literature. In fact, in 2020, with the anti-reactionary thought law that was introduced in North Korea, we see that just legitimizing further and a consistent persecution of Christians in that nation. But honestly, it is harder for it to get worse than it is today. Last year, Afghanistan held the number one ranking on the Open Doors World Watch list after U.S. troops withdrew from the country in 2021. This year, Afghanistan is ranked number nine. The Christians that remain have gone deep underground, and so they're Few of, there are fewer Christians remaining and few of them are willing to, to raise their heads and be seen. Among other countries of concern, India, China and Nigeria. That West African country is now ranked at number six. Just last week, assailants set the home of Roman Catholic priest Isaac Ache on fire, burning him to death. President Biden removed Nigeria from the U.S. list of countries of particular concern after the Trump administration gave the country that designation in late 2020. There is clear evidence that there is persecution of Christians because of their faith. We would urge them to, to put Nigeria back onto that list of countries of particular concern. Open Doors is asking that people contact members of Congress about Nigeria and other countries to get involved in helping the persecuted church and to pray daily for suffering Christians worldwide. Gary Lane, CBN News. It's real. Christians get mowed down. Listen, we, we, get, we get upset because we have to eat lunch by ourselves sometimes because people don't want to hang out with us because what what we believe or, or we don't have that friend circle or, or we get laughed at. Man, there's people in this world that are dying. But there's a lot of hope in this passage because in... In verse 7 especially, because what it does, it says, you know what? There's coming a day. You know, they're not going to get away with it forever. Matter of fact, Dr. Ralph Davis, greatest Old Testament professor ever, said this. He said, apparently they didn't see the sign that read, beware sheep. You touch God's people and you'll find for yourself sooner or later having to deal with their God. The response of heaven to those crushing God's people is the terror of judgment. Yahweh delivers his people by judging and destroying their enemies. <laughs> you know, and so the psalm that says here at the end, Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. That it's coming. Now notice this. It doesn't say if, but when. The Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let, let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. That the psalmist cries out, salvation for his people is coming when the Lord comes. Matter of fact, he says, hey, hey, Jacob is going to rejoice, his people. Let Israel be glad. Listen, there is coming a day when all those who stand against the Lord, you know what? They're going to come face to face with God. And you might get ridiculed and you might hey, hurt but I want, I want you to know this. Sometimes you might even feel alone, but just look up. Because there's a God who's looking down. And not only will he judge the wicked, notice he's going to restore the fortunes of his people. And I promise you this, whatever you may lose here on this earth living for Jesus... It may not seem worth it now, but there's coming a day. There's coming a day when he's going to bless your socks off more than you could ever imagine. And what you receive in eternity will make up for any cruelty you face on this earth. There's, there's much darkness. There's, <laughs> we live in a dark world, but you are a trophy of God's grace to whom he is delighted in. 
And you may look to your left and right and wonder, am I it? No. God is your refuge. God is your stronghold. God is your fortress. And it doesn't matter if the world rages against us. All of those people who live as if God is not relevant. Listen, it hurts when people hurt me. And it hurts when people hurt my children or my spouse or my church or whatever. You know, it, it hurts. And, and, but listen, they're just, they don't believe God's relevant. And when this world seeks to squeeze the life out of you, just remember, you, hey, God is my, my refuge. He said it. So let me just end this message here. Are you a fool or are you a family? You're either one or the other today. You're either a fool that you came in, God's not really relevant in your life, and maybe you say that you believe in God. Listen, the Bible says even the demons believe and tremble, okay, all right? So, so don't, don't, don't throw that at me. The biggest evidence that you believe that God is relevant, that Jesus Christ is your Savior, is not what you tell me you believe. Let me, let me tell you this. It's also not your memory. Well, I was a kid. I repeated a prayer in Bible school. You know, I asked Jesus into my heart. Let me tell you this. The greatest evidence that you are a Christian is not that you remember you quoted some words. Guys, the greatest evidence that you are a believer is that Jesus Christ has changed your life. And so either you are a fool living as if God is irrelevant or you are in the family of God. One or the other, there is no straddling this fence. There is no in-between. You're either in one group or the other. You're either in the foolish group that, listen, that is going to meet God face to face one day. Or you are part of the family that's going to meet God face to face one day. And the contrast is clear. Matter of fact, Jesus ended the Sermon on the Mount. Every, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a what? Foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Listen, you're either on the rock or you're on the sand. You're, you're either the wise man who is following Jesus and his words or you are the foolish man who thinks God is irrelevant. You're either one or the other. But can I tell you today, one of these days, your house is going to face the storm of all storms. And if you are a foolish man who built his, his house on the sand, believing God is irrelevant. The, listen, the Bible begins, what? In the beginning, God. That means he is relevant. That means right there that you must submit. If he is God, then you need to submit to him as God. But listen to me, if you don't, one of these days you're going to face God face to face in all of his glory, in all of his righteousness and justice. And can I just tell you this? And if you meet him without Jesus, great will be your fear. You know, great will be your fear. Can I just say this? You may walk out of here and treat God like he's irrelevant, but on that day, he's going to be very relevant to you. Listen, eternity is forever. Having forever the wrath of God being poured out on you is going to be a hellish event. That's why we call it hell. So I'm begging you 
today. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Who was righteous and is righteous. Who paid a price that you could not pay so that you could give your life to him. And let him take that wrath for you. I'm begging you. I'm asking you to give your life to Jesus. I'm not asking you to repeat a prayer after me. I'm asking you to go to give your life. To believe in your heart that you are a sinner and, and deserving of that wrath. To, to, to give your life to Jesus. To ask Christ to save you. To live and, and, and let him be your Lord and Savior to where he's relevant. And, and yeah, you're going to mess up. And yeah, you're going to slip down. But you keep getting back up and, and, and you live for him. And, and you give him your life. And when hard times come, he's your refuge. And, and you remind yourself of that. And, and, and you just keep on living for him. So I don't have a so what today that I normally have at the end. You know, a bunch of questions. It's either you are a fool or you're a family today. One or the other. Where are you? Where are you? Is, is Christ relevant to you? Is Jesus relevant? Is God relevant? Or are you living your life every day going, no, God. No, God. I'm going to be me. I'm going to do my own thing. You know, I'm going to get whatever boyfriend I want. Whatever girlfriend I want. You know, I'm going to do with my life whatever I want. And you live your life. One of these days, God's going to become relevant. You will not be able to turn him away then. Give your life to Jesus today, please. Will you bow your heads? Lord, God, I know that there's been some times in my life that I've done foolish things. But Lord, thank you for saving me, redeeming me. Say, God, coming into my heart, Lord, and changing my direction. So God, I pray, Lord, help me. Lord, to as a believer, a Christian, one who claims to have Jesus as the Lord of his life, God, help me to live the rest of this day as if you're relevant. And then tomorrow and the next day. Father, God, I, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would speak to me and and God, help me to repent, uh, Lord, of those areas that, God, I've allowed to, to remain in my life, God, that I haven't given over to you. God, I pray we as believers, as Christians this morning in this building, that, God, that we would surrender our all, our everything completely, totally to you. And that, God, that we'll go forth from this day and be live our life believing that you're truly relevant. You're real. You are the in the beginning God. You're my God, my Savior, my Lord, my Adonai, my Master. God, you are my everything. Father God, I pray today for the person who walked in this room and God hasn't been relevant at all in their life. They've done their own thing, gone their own way. God, and Lord, now you got them here to hear this message. And I pray that right now where they sit, that while I'm praying, they're praying that they're surrendering their life, asking you to save them, asking you to come into their life, asking you, O oh Lord, to make them new, 
a new creature. And God, I pray, Lord, that they'll do that right now so that when that day comes, that God, that they do not face you without Jesus. Lord, help them to see their sin. Help them, God, to see their, where they're at, their condition. Lord, the only way they're going to see it is you show it to them. Lord, please help them. And Father, I pray that they too, Lord, would leave this room today believing and living their life as you are very relevant. Lord, help us. Help that person. And God, I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, look, I know it's late, but you know, the Gene, Gene, this part Gene's fault, you know, I mean, Gene had y'all share how good God is, and God's really good, so we spent some time there, and then Kevin got, and, and, you know, let's, let's end with some worship. Remember where you came from. What are we singing? Uh, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yeah, remember.